Welcome to GRIT, the Real Estate Growth Mindset Podcast, hosted by Brian Charlesworth, founder of Sisu. Sisu provides growth automation software for real estate. You'll hear stories from real estate thought and technology leaders, team owners, and brokers on how they grew their business in a rapidly changing industry. You'll learn how to transform your brokerage and teams into a high-performing and analytics-driven business so you have a new, durable, competitive advantage against disruption in your market. So let's get right into it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Grit Podcast, where we like to dig in with entrepreneurs and business builders on their grit and what makes them successful. I'm Brian Charlesworth. I'm the founder of Sisu, the SaaS real estate growth automation software, and your host of the show. And today we have Robbie T with us from Hatch Coaching and uh, Nathan Jones, who I believe you go by Nate. Uh, so Nate, uh, and Nate is the co-founder and CEO of Structurally. And for those of you who don't know who stru what Structurally is, we're going to dive into that some more today. But Structurally is basically, my understanding in one sentence, is AI for real estate that's focused on more effective conversations, leads, and messaging. So we'll talk more about that today. I'm excited to have you guys on the show. Welcome. Thanks for having us, Brian. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, Robbie, why don't you start by just giving us a little bit more of your background, because I know you run a huge team. Yeah. It, you know, I think a lot of people got hit hard in March and April. I don't know if you did, but everyone seems, at least all of our customers, seem to be totally on top of their game right now. Yeah. So I'd love for you to give us a little bit, in addition to Hatch Coaching, Robbie runs a massive, massively producing team. Um, <laughs> I don't know how massive they are, but they put up some huge numbers. Uh, and Robbie is, my understanding is you're really not like full time there now, right? You've been able to step away and have that run its, uh, run its course and yeah. that business runs on its own. So tell us more about how you've done this and more about your, your background and your team. Yeah, so the, the simplest thing I always want to clarify is if you've, heard, if you've heard of Eric Hatch, we're, we're business partners in Hatch Coaching and he is still the CEO of uh, half realty. He's still involved day to day. And I'm always kind of been that systems nerd right behind the scenes the nerdy guy behind everything. And uh, for those of you don't, that don't know, I actually started in real estate as an ISA. I was a boots on the ground ISA that was making the calls, doing the dirty work. Uh, I actually knocked doors. I don't know if I've ever told you that, that Nate, but I, I was knocking doors. Never want to do that again. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's funny because uh, before I even got into real estate, to really go back, I actually used to work in politics. I used to work field campaigns where I was door knocking and making calls for political candidates. And uh, let me promise you one thing, Brian, if there's one thing that is less popular than sales, I guarantee you it's politics, uh, especially in this day and age in the last you know, 10 years or so, uh, the polarization that's been created. I've been called, you name it, I've been called it. So huh, it, it's nuts. Um, anyways, we have a really, really top. How point. does a how does a nerd? You call yourself a nerd. How does a technology nerd become a sales guy? I mean, that's it's like how does that happen? Because those are opposite qualities, right, Robbie? They really are. I think that's what actually gave me such an advantage in sales was I look at sales so much differently. Sales really isn't that hard. I think we overthink it. Sales to me actually is less about sales and real estate. It's more about service. That's the funny thing that the, the, the only people really working in sales in real estate are builders. They're the only people selling a product. The rest of everyone else is working in a service industry guise as a sales industry, right? And really all it comes down to is finding out what somebody needs, wants, and desires and helping them get it. And when I worked in, in campaigns, you know what I, I did, Brian, was what they told me to do was, and it's going to sound really familiar to what you hear in real estate, is go up to people and tell them why they should vote for one of our candidates. The problem was, is if I wanted, went up to you, Brian, and you were in the middle or the opposite party, you wouldn't even give me the light of day if I tried selling. Instead, right. if I came up and I said, Brian, man, tell me what matters to you this election. I guarantee you, you'd open up for five, 10 minutes about the things that mattered to you. So my whole approach when I came into this game was not at all sales. It was building a connection. I, I did a whole TED talk um, and we can post that. I, I was just gonna say, uh, if you guys haven't heard Robbie's TED talk, 
go <laughs> listen to that and you'll get details so, on what he's talking about when he talks about the three C's here. Three C's, always be curious, connecting and collaborating. The always be closing is, is dying. Frankly, it's been dead because there's, there's more accountability in the marketplace today than there was 10, 20 years ago, right? I, I can go online and find out who's screwing people over like that. There's more consumer choice because of the internet than there ever has been before. And I mean, people are more knowledgeable today than they were 30 years ago before the internet was around? Uh, I, I don't know about knowledgeable, but they sure have access to more knowledge. That's for sure. They're yeah, looking. there you go. Access to information is yeah, always at our fingertips, right? It's probably a little more fake news than, than there used to be, but well, you see the point, right? Uh, so for me, when, when I got into sales, I started as an IMSA, and really my whole approach, frankly, when I, when I got into the game, Brian, was call old leads and try to convert them, and nobody else would do that. Uh, one, because they weren't hiring an ISA, it wasn't their full-time gig, um, but secondly, they were asking their agents to do it, and you and I both know how that usually goes, right? It does not go well. And what I did was I just simply started calling through old leads, and my opening script was always, hey, Brian, saw that you were looking at some homes on one of our websites a while back, and I just wanted to reach out, see if you're just kind of looking for fun, or to see if you plan on potentially making a move in the future. And then I just, honestly, the best script in the book to get them to open up was, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And that's our whole, our whole business. Our whole business philosophy really has nothing, whether it's coaching or real estate or anything we do, it really has you know, nothing to do with sales. It has everything to do with service. Our core is service. We actually say that our, you know, our coaching company is all about redefining how people treat people because I've seen how poorly people do it in our industry and frankly, many other industries where they're always pushing, manipulating, coercing people, that sort of thing. Um, but to tie this all together, our real estate team um, to this year, by large, best year we've ever had. Um, how many agents are you up to now? Uh, say that again? Just so people understand, how many agents, how many ISAs do you guys have? Four full-time ISAs, six full-time agents, and three full-time listing agents. And okay, then so you have six buyer's agents, three Correct. listing agents, so nine, nine agents. Correct. Six ISAs, you said? Four ISAs. Yep. Nine four agents, four ISAs, yep. 13 people yep. doing these kinds of numbers. So for those of you who run teams yep. or are on teams, I want you to pay close attention. And, and we got to talk about why in a second. But just to give you the numbers, we, we sold 630-ish homes. And, and I, it's not even me, right? It's them. They're doing it. It's not me doing it. It's them. The ISAs, the agents, they're doing the work. Um, and then we just had the best June we've ever had. We pended darn near a million dollars worth of GCI um, through the team. And Which was how many transactions? Oh, goodness. 120, I think. Somewhere around that number. That's 120 right. with 13 people actually working the business yeah. and on the sell side. Um, you said you had one agent that did a, an enormous number last month. 27, I believe was the number. 26 or 27 pennies in one month. Is this a listing agent? No, buyer agent. Buyer, buyer agent. agent. So That's even more impressive. It's, it's, so you know what my philosophy is, Brian? And, and Nate knows this. I think the way people approach, and we're doing a whole webinar on this, uh, Eric and I are. I think the way people approach growing the real estate teams is fundamentally flawed. Because here's what happens. Somebody becomes good. They sell 30, 40, or 50 homes. And then they start thinking, I want to work less, right? And make more money. It happens every single time. And then what happens is they start saying, I'm going to grow a real estate team. It happens every single time. So what do they do? They go hire some agents, right? Then they bring these agents in and then they go buy more leads to keep these agents busy. Well, guess what the agents do? They don't really do anything with those leads. <laughs> and then they get frustrated because then they have to hire someone else with this go hire more ISAs or go hire other companies or frankly go buy a ton more leads. And what happens is a year or two later, later Brian, they end up working way more because they're trying to train these people to become better. They probably didn't hire them right in the first place and they make a whole lot less money. It will shock you, Brian, how many people I've met that have done this and they literally would be better off, far better off, not doing any of that and just producing themselves, just being their own producer and they make way more money and work a ton less. And 
we believe our whole model, like, and that's why I got to clarify our team is we believe in using a partner model to really grow our agents, our agent counts. And it's slower. It's more methodical. And by a partner model, really what we're doing is somebody comes into our team and they start as a showing partner and you earn the right to eventually become an agent. That showing partner is direct leverage and support for one of our agents. So every single agent, essentially every agent on our team has at least one showing partner who is their partner in crime. They're helping manage those clients and really grow the business. And where everybody goes wrong is this, is they just say, hey, come join my team um, as an agent, right? And either you get the leftovers of some other brokerage, usually, or your pool of talent that you get a pick from is people, because <laughs> your value proposition is, hey, leave your job. You're not going to make any money for six to 12 months. Come on over. Most sane people would never even consider that. Whereas the people that come and join our team are former engineers, former teachers, really quality people that come over, and, and Nate has met a few of these guys. They come over and they crush it, but they have to sit in the showing partner role. It's like a paid internship, frankly. And then eventually they earn the right to become an agent. Every single agent in our world started off as, as a partner besides one. And it's been a huge shift for us. I have a question here for you, Robbie, and I've done a webinar with you, so I know yeah. your answer, but I want you to share this with everyone because I talked to, I mean, I, I'm meeting with, um, and, and honestly coaching in a sense, yeah. a lot of our customers yeah. on how to take their businesses to the next level. Mm -hmm. And a lot of teams out there have hired ISAs, just like you hire a showing assistant, this is where you start, you can work your way into an agent role. Yeah. So I didn't hear you say, hey, we hire ISAs and they can work their way into an agent role. I know ISA is like the core center of your business. So talk to me about how you treat your ISAs and how you keep ISAs in the ISA role. Because I think that's I mean, I think every team out there has tried at one point or another, if, they, if they're you know, a fairly good size and have been around for a few years, they've tried to build ISAs. But their ISAs in 90% of these teams want to become agents. So talk to us about that. Yeah. The very Before Robbie answers that, the one thing I want to say from an outsider perspective slightly is, you know, coming from a software company, selling in the real estate and mortgage, uh, agent turnover is astronomical it's it's something that has always blown my mind you know how quickly agents will turn over um first of all robbie's team hatch hatch realty they've got that figured out but isa turnover is it blows agent turnover out of the water i i have heard horror story after horror story about hiring isas uh and it's just ridiculous so robbie whatever your answer is please uh, save, save everyone. <laughs> so Robbie addressed this and then I want to jump in with Nate and learn more about structurally, but hundred percent. So you're, you're, you're right. ISA turnover is, uh, it's, it's, uh, way worse than, than agent turnover. So the biggest shift, Brian, is we don't view the ISA rules as stepping stone, right? We don't. And that's simply what, what a lot of teams do is they hire somebody, they say, you can come in and you can start as an ISA, you become good at it. And if you become good at it, if is a key word, um, and then you move into an agent role. Um, and sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But the problem is, is that lead conversion is all about the long-term play and you're just pressing restart every six months. And it's just, it's not good for anybody involved. Um, so it's amazing. Especially training, right? If you're the one doing that training, that's oh, to do that constantly. Oh, it's pain. It's a full-time job, right? Yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly. And then you go hire, frankly, coaching companies to bring them in. And, you know, what I've learned to do is I, I be, frankly, my goal is to always make sure I'm coaching the right person now because it got so exhausting coaching somebody that would turn out almost like that. The other big thing is this. What people need to realize is hiring an ISA is hiring much differently than an agent. And that's because an ISA is literally, and we're going to talk more about this, what they're doing every single day. Um, they're sitting in a box, making phone calls, whether that box is at home or whether that's in the office, they're sitting in a box, making phone calls, connecting with people via text. Um, that's becoming more and more normal, Q uh, structurally. Um, but you're connecting with people via text message and engaging in conversation 
frankly, via your computer, and you get almost no face-to-face -face time with other people, almost none, um, very limited. And if you are naturally drawn to real estate, almost always you're a people person, right? Almost every salesperson in real estate loves working with people. And the problem with this ISA role is you really don't get much of that. Now, it's not to say that some, someone that is a very gregarious, outgoing person can't succeed in this role, but it is a lot more of an uphill challenge for them to really stay in it for a long period of time. And Nate and I actually, uh, on our podcast that we did for a while, uh, the ISA radio, we had the privilege of interviewing some of the top ISAs in the country. And some of those were the anomalies out there. Um, but staying in that role at the top producers, generally what we're seeing, and this role has actually even shifted since we talked to them, this role is shifting even more so towards database management. That's really what this is becoming is you have to leverage automation. And, and the big thing that nobody's talking about, Brian, and they need to wake up to is the, the effectiveness of a phone call continues to nosedive. All right, we started talking about this, Nate, a year and a half ago, and it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. We saw call, or call answer rates go up briefly um, during COVID simply because People were bored at home compared to what they were. They were craving human contact. And then number three, nobody really talks about this. They were expecting phone calls from random phone numbers, right? Small business association, their mortgage. Uh, they were a tenant trying to get a hold of the landlord. So they were expecting phone calls from random phone numbers a lot more likely than they are, you know, once things. So that was, a, that was an April, May thing, not, April, a, not yeah. a June, July thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Now that's gone out the window. And the thing for us, Brian, we took full advantage of it, to be completely frank. And if you heard us coaching during, during all of that, I told people that it was one of the greatest lead generation opportunities I've ever seen because call answer rates jumped up to like 20%. We haven't seen above for us 10, 10% in years. So we're like, yeah. what the heck is going on here? So I remember a short period. I actually talked to you during that, Robbie, and you said mm -hmm. it was at 38%, I remember, at one yeah. point. There were numbers that I've never seen, but you know, haven't seen in years, I should say, before. And that was a, it was a blip, right? That that already went away. It's already gone because most people, in some way, shape, or form, are working again. They may be working from home, but not expecting those calls and call answer rates have dipped back down to close to normal what they were. And here's the simple answer: Do I think that call answer rates are going to be higher or lower in five years? Lower, right? Hands down. The most likely person to answer a phone call is someone that's older. And the reality is, is that more and more people playing in the real estate game, buying and selling are younger. And they're a lot more likely to frankly ignore your phone call because they don't want to answer it. So mm -hmm. the, the big thing for us is the ISA roles, database management, really what that means. You got to hire someone that is much different. And then the other thing where people go wrong, Brian, is they think that the ISA role is an eight to five job. And that's just not possible. Even if you leverage uh, everything, even if you're using structurally to help, the reality is, is there gonna, there's going to be times where you need to get on the phone with the lead, whether you're texting them back or calling them back on nights and weekends, and therefore you need to have somebody that is hungry enough to inconvenience himself and call that person, text that person, and you got to have a system that incentivizes it, right? You can't have the right person in a system that says, hey, go work 50, 60 hours a week and you can only make $30,000 a year. Who the hell would do that? No one, right? If, if I said that to any of us, but no chance. But if we said you got the right person and the right system, you have the potential to make over $100,000 and our top ISAs make that after being in the, the role for a year, that changes everything. So anyways, that's my long answer to your short question. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is gonna be a handoff to you, Nate, but one of the things Robbie talked about was ISAs are no longer just people with personality who are going to be making phone calls. And it almost seems to me by uh, your sign language, by your facial expressions there, Robbie, that the texting and the other means of communication are equally, if not more important than being able to make the phone calls. And so yeah. that's why Structurally exists, I believe. Tell us more, tell us more about Structurally, Nate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously, like you guys have been talking about, we do uh, texting follow-up with real estate, mortgage leads, 
uh, and the qualification as well. So not only do we try and get them to engage, like Robbie was mentioning, you know, we, we nurture them until they respond. Uh, we actually have the two-way qualifying conversation with them to kind of weed out the, the good uh, from the bad, you know, looky loos um, while, all while keeping you in the loop. So, you know, our primary users can range from anyone from uh, an individual agent to an ISA. Like Robbie has said before, if you don't have an ISA, you are the ISA. So uh, for the most part, you can think of all of our users as inside sales agents. Um, but, you know, at a high level, I completely agree with Robbie. The, the role of this inside salesperson, regardless of if that's their title or not, is database management the the what everyone is shifting to now especially with technology you know like sisu and like all the crms that you plug into uh and all the lead sources that you plug into i mean it's just a lot to manage but that can be a good thing uh we have a lot more data at our fingertips where our lead came from what they've been doing have they opened an email have they answered a call have they been on your website did they see an ad did they get retargeted with an ad? We have way more data at our fingertips than ever before. And, you know, we plug into some of that data to make really contextual messages, you know, matter. Uh, and that's something that Robbie, I, I, I think that you should definitely talk about. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, it, it just kind of comes down to database management. And we help to automate that by, you know, having the conversations with leads so we surface the, the hot ones up to the top four ISAs to still try and call. So at the end of the day, we're still trying to get to a call. It's just, we have built that slight bit of rapport. We have told the lead like a phone number to be expecting a call from and who to be expecting the call from. And guess what? They are far more likely to actually answer the phone call uh, than just a cold, you know, outbound phone call. So, that's kind of where we fit into everything in terms of the automation and in the role um, and really what we're doing here. Okay, so when I, um, when I looked up information on structurally, the word or term AI comes up, right? Um, there's so many companies that talk about AI today that, or they talk about machine learning or whatever that is, but that's, I think it's such high level and people have gone like, okay, AI, whatever. Tell us, tell us specifically, I mean, like, what is it specifically that you guys are doing to, to really leverage and make it easier for me to get to that, that user? And you just did a little bit as far as preparing them for a phone call, but are there other things and how do you guys do that? Yeah, so this uh, kind of goes off of something that we believe in to our core that we launched yesterday. Uh, we absolutely, absolutely hate the word chatbot here. I'm sure everyone is somewhat familiar with the word bot, chatbot, whatever. You know, I'll be completely honest with you. We're a chatbot company. You can think now, of didn't it. Didn't you just declare war on chatbots? We it, did. I, I we, see that. <laughs> we wrote our declaration of war on bad chatbots because we hate them that much. But <laughs> I, I'll be completely honest and transparent with you. We're a chatbot company. Uh, but deep down we hate that word more than anything in the world because it doesn't provide the level of customer service that Robbie was mentioning at the start of this that this that is so important chatbots in the traditional sense you know have been overhyped and underdelivered and they're just terrible and that you're just constantly met with you know i'm sorry i don't understand can you please repeat it can you please repeat it in the way that i understand specifically uh, please don't go off script. That's, that's not how our product works. Our product works just like you're talking to a human. And, you know, what we really believe in is uh, authentic automation. You know, we believe in when someone says, you know, I'm a veteran, we say, thank you for your service. If we say, if someone says, I'm going through a divorce or something like that, I'm so sorry to hear that. Going through a death, you know, there are very large life events that typically cause someone to move. And the last thing that we uh, want to do is not, you know, not acknowledge that, you know, like Robbie was saying, people want to be heard, understood and valued. And chatbots don't do that. But authentic AI or our, our conversational AI 
does that. And that just drives the conversation so much further forward so that when an ISA jumps on the phone with a lead, they can say, hey, you know, one of the follow up, uh, I know you were talking to our assistant, uh, Asa, who is the name that we gave it. Um, I saw that you were going through a divorce. I'm so sorry to hear that, uh, you know, and so on, go on uh, and, you know, hopefully close the appointment. And, you know, Robbie has talked about why those things matter so much in conversation uh, and how to handle them. And, you know, we've even gone so far to work with uh, people like Robbie and Hatch Coaching to develop scripts that, you know, actually mirror match and uh, do those types of things to, to drive the conversation forward. So it's not just the chat bot. It, it is a very authentic feeling conversation and we take a lot of pride in that. If you've been enjoying Grit, please help us continue to grow the channel by leaving a five-star review and sharing it with a friend. Now back to Grit. So when you say chatbot, like, what are you referring to? Um, because a lot of people, I think, might think of a chatbot of like an intercom yeah. chat logo icon that's down at the bottom of a web page, which most of those have people behind them, right? I mean, that's a great way that our community, at Sisu, we have one of those, and our yeah. Our development team actually works very closely with our success or customer success team because it's all intertwined in there. So right. um, when you think of chatbot, describe more of what you're actually referring to. Yeah, what I usually think of as a chatbot is, um, you know, something that is more or less scripted and very button based and rigid. You know, it doesn't really matter to me what the, the medium of converse, where you're having the conversation is. Uh, it can be live chat, it can be text, it can be Facebook. If you're chatting with something that's very obviously not a person, very obviously uh, trying to persuade you to only go down a certain path, otherwise it's gonna break and you're gonna be confused yeah. and, and leave, that's a chat bot. There are experiences that are extremely rigid. You have to click a button. It's not really even that conversational and uh, there's really no value to it. So, you know, we, we plug in to all the same sources that I'm sure that you guys do, uh, you know, Zillow, the CRMs, Facebook. So when a lead fills out a form, we text them and we continue to text them until they respond. And as soon as they do respond, you know, it's a free, free flowing conversation talking about, you know, their divorce, a new job, a new child, and still trying to drive the conversation forward in a meaningful way, you know, understanding their time frame, are they looking to get financing, paying cash, working with an agent, uh, and then, you know, hopefully leading into an appointment. So it is very flexible. There is no such thing as a script, although you can completely customize our conversations. You know, if someone, someone can say anything at any point in the conversation, it's not button based, it doesn't force you to go down a specific path. It's very free, free flowing uh, and still, you know, driving the conversation forward in a meaningful way. I'm guessing, I'm guessing every chat bot out there is like trying to get more intelligent. Otherwise <laughs> they've got to know they're going to die. Right. Yeah. Um, but Robbie, why don't uh, you tell us how you use this in your business? Cause I know you use structurally. So uh, like, let's talk about that for a minute. How does this benefit your ISAs? And I'm guessing your ISAs are focused on database management more than they are phone calls. Yeah, pretty much. So I actually want to dive into what you were just talking about of, of chatbots versus what Nate and them are doing. And actually, this is going to sound crazy, but if I were to give a leg up to a chatbot ran by humans or the chatbot of ASA ran by structurally, I would choose structurally all day long because it's predictable every single time to say the right thing. I have seen, as odd as it sounds, humans say some really stupid stuff. I see it over and over and over again. And the moment it breaks, they, they'll, they'll literally say, and Nate can show you it from the bad chatbot stuff. They will say some crazy stuff. The, the nuts thing about what Nate has built um, is, is really simply this. There's something called the- Before the, you go, the there, can I add something to that? Yeah. Um, yeah. You, because you talked about um, the fact that these chatbots are maybe, or not chatbots, but this structurally is maybe more predictable, more intelligent than what we as humans might say. 
But I, I'd like to add to that too, as, as humans, we respond sometimes hours or even days later instead of real time, right? So the response time, which my experience of cells, which I've had a lot of in my lifetime is it's all about response time, right? If you respond in a few minutes, you're probably in good shape. If you respond later than five minutes, you may not be. Yeah. Oh yeah, humans don't, or what I like to say is humans forget or they get tired and structurally never does, right? It just, it's just computer code, it keeps running. But my favorite thing I wanted to say about it, Brian, is we've, we've sent over probably too many leads structurally, if there's such a thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's something in the AI world called the Turing test, right? Or Turing test, which is really, is a human recognizing that they're talking to a computer versus a real human. And the crazy thing about it, Brian, is it's incredibly rare, single digits, that someone will out the chat bot, that it's, it's not a real person. It is incredibly rare. Um, you see it actually more probably more common with a real chatbot potentially with a person than with structurally. So that's been crazy to see. That was, and for, for everyone that knows, when, when I wanted to test out what Nate had built, because we met what, is it coming up on three years ago, Nate, give or take? Yeah. Something like that, a while ago now. Um, we actually just sent them over our junk. <laughs> I literally sent them our leftover junk leads and that is one of the first things I, I always like to do because if it can do something with junk, I know it's going to work really well with new stuff. And that's where we've really leveraged um, structurally in our business because we do have the full-time ISAs who scrub the living heck out of our database, right? With calls, text, emails. What we wanted to do was we give it all our leftovers. And I think it was within like a couple of days or a week, I don't remember, uh, we found two two leads, one that was a buy sell and one that was a buy or a sell, I don't remember now, that ended up converting just like that. So I, I think for, for you all, if you don't have an ISA, structurally is one of those things that can be your ISA. And even in our case, we use structurally to leverage our, our ISAs. And uh, Cody, one of my ISAs, I think he sent like a, a thousand leads over to, to Nate. So sorry about that, Nate, for overwhelming you guys. But Really, the, the focus is we're using it to leverage what our ISAs are doing and leverage the production of our ISAs. Okay. So, Robbie, while you're talking about your technologies, tell us what other technologies you guys use, how you leverage. I mean, technology is the name of the game in this space now, right? right. I mean, if you were running this business like someone ran... So, what else are you doing? Yeah, great, great question. So a couple of things. One, we're, we're using structurally. Um, we use YLOPO on the front end to create a lot of opportunities and they do a lot of our digital retargeting as well. Um, so we're using YLOPO as well to do a lot of our creating of force registration leads, retargeting our old leads. We're doing retargeting of cold data with, uh, with uh, YLOPO um, and, and they got that fine tuned down to a T. The other big thing we use is I'm a huge fan of Sierra Interactive. I'm a huge fan of it because in addition to all the messaging that you can use it structurally, we've built really elongated and powerful messaging plans within Sierra Interactive. Um, it's really funny and I haven't even had the opportunity to really share this with Nate, but we are actually shifting our whole perspective on how we chase leads, right? The old school model of follow-up used to be you following up with leads, right? We're now shifting it using Sierra that when we have follow-ups that, that we want to follow up with, we're not even manually calling them anymore, Brian and Nate. We're not even calling them. Instead, what we're doing is we're using fully automated plans that we've built in Sierra. And what it does is it leaves a voicemail drop and then it sends a text right after then another text. The crazy thing about it is when we started doing this, instead of manually following up with leads, it sounds crazy, we actually started contacting 37% of people within one day. That number is usually 25% if we're manually doing all the work. And here's why I'm so excited about it. It's because one of the biggest things about being an ISA is you're capped at how many people you put in your pipeline, right? Your follow-ups are your pipeline. 
one of the cool things that we're doing in Sierra is we're using fully automated follow-up campaigns because you can really four or five X the size of your pipeline because you don't have to manually call these people anymore. Now we're kind of separating it where we're going to manually follow up with people that we have a very emotional conversation with. But if it's someone like I'm waiting a year to, to, to buy a home for X reason, it's more surface level. We're going to put that on a fully automated campaign. That's just going to do the follow up for us and layering that voicemail drop and a text message. What's happening is if I were to put you on it, Brian, literally people think that we're calling and what happens is they call back 25% of the time they're calling us back or they're texting us back. So we're shifting that dynamic, right? Follow-up used to be about the salesperson or ISA following up. We're switching it. So the leads are following up with us and changing that whole dynamic. And when you have to do that in this day and age, because people don't answer like they used to. So it's been crazy. We just started beta testing this about a month and a half, two months ago. And the numbers have been stupid. And Jim is, Jim contacted, and actually one of my favorite stories is Cody, one of my ISAs, put this on, I forget how many leads, but his phone overheated because people kept calling for hours. He had 200 people call or text him back within two hours. Like we've never seen anything like this with plans like this. So the old school, actually, I got to show you something. You'll love this. <laughs> It's, it's this whole thing right here. You need to work smarter, not harder. And that's what tech is doing. Uh, this used to hang in my office, now it sits in the door. But my whole mindset is, and I've told Nate this, we're focused on scale. And scale is doing more with less. Growth is doing more with more, which a lot of people are obsessed with in real estate and it's unhealthy. Because they spend more money, they make less money oftentimes. We're focused on scale. Um, and by the way, Brian, you're going to love this. I, I just logged into our CSU account so I can share my screen and show you our dashboard um, because another piece of tech, the final one we're using is CSU to track what the heck we're doing <laughs> and visualize it and, and see certain things on, on what we're doing. And we'll show you the numbers for our pendings and all that here in a little bit. But Sierra is a big piece. We're using YLOCO on the marketing side. Um, structurally on um, chasing a lot of our older opportunities that frankly just slipped in the cracks. Um, and then c is helping us visualize our data so we know what the heck's going on with all of it. And, I, and yeah, I'd love for you to share and thanks for sharing that. Um, CSU is something I usually don't talk about on the podcast, but we just rolled out about a month ago now, uh, really all of the contract to close things that you need. So Trello-like, um, you know, Kanban boards where you're managing your tasks, uh, commissions, mm -hmm. the, you know, everything that you need to get to close, including document management as well now. So those are some things that I don't think you guys have checked out on, on CSU yet. So you should probably do that because talking about scale and growing with less, that will allow you to, to do it with far less uh, TCs as you guys continue to grow. And, and Brian, you guys released that and there's no upcharge, right? It's just... Right. You got a, a yep. lot of people. That we, are, hey, we were originally we were were originally thinking, hey, we're going to charge more for this, and then we just decided, hey, let's just give this to all of our existing customers. So I like it. Yeah, we we still got to dive in, but uh, okay. I mean, the one thing that I think, sorry to jump in, but the one thing I think I've never realized about your story here that's kind of uh, funny and coming full, full circle is um, when you started in politics and in real estate. You, you did everything that doesn't scale. You did things that don't scale. You literally started door knocking. That is one of the least scalable possible things you could ever do. And now look at you three, five years later, you barely even work. <laughs> is it only that much later? I mean, uh, yeah, how, how, long is, how long is this tra transition taken, Robert? Uh, seven years. I, well, yeah, coming up on seven years. It feels, I was an ISA for three, three years and now I've been in coaching and stuff. But yeah, I don't, I don't produce myself anymore. You're, you're actually, it's funny that you bring that up, Nate, because I just read Blitz Scaling yeah. and they literally yeah. talked about how if you want to learn how to scale, do things that don't scale. It's literally like the fund, one of the fundamental rules. So that's, I, don't I think that's that. why, yeah, that's why you're so good at the whole authentic piece of this stuff. You're not just like throwing tech at stuff that uh, isn't gonna work. You're not, I've seen that a whole lot in real estate, especially, you know, 
everyone wants the new shiny object. They throw a bunch of time, money, and effort into it, then it dies and yeah. explodes. Yeah. Um, you are very deliberate with the tech that you bring on, and you're very deliberate about your team. You're very deliberate about your ISAs uh, and your systems and staying on top of all that. So you're not just you know throwing random stuff at the wall. Mm-hmm. You're, you're actually thinking about how it all fits together, how your team should be using it. And I think that's the right way to scale. You know, I think that word gets overused a little bit. I love your definition of uh, growth is doing more with more and uh, scale is doing more with less because that's one of our big uh, values at Structurally is doing more with less. Um, and I think that that is lost somewhat in real estate. Everyone wants to just throw a bunch of new tech and that's doing more with more. Doing more with less is being able to actually do what you've done. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Are listening just on podcast, but as well. Uh, to can, can see what you just share. Yeah, uh, I would like people to be able to see how many pending units you have today if yeah. you have that readily available uh, yeah. for a team of 13, team of 13 agents to uh to be growing at the pace you guys are right now. You did 600 transactions last year and. What are you on pace to do this year? Um, well, let's go take a peek quick. Um, that's the wrong thing. Let's see here. Where is it at? There it is. All right. So let's, uh, you can probably describe this even better than I can, Brian. Can you guys see this, by the way? Is this coming through? Uh, yeah. So let's go to your uh, team dashboard. Go dashboard team up there. Nope. Let's see there. There it is. And so here, here we can see... Um, we can see you guys have already closed and forecasted. That's your closed and pending already at 559. Yeah. So you're well on pace to do over a thousand units this year from yeah. 600 last year, I would which say is amazing. Probably 800. 800 okay. foot. This doesn't be, and the reason is our market literally tanks in Thursday, or November, December. Okay. But we're in the frozen tundra. But yeah, we for sure, I mean, we're going to blow past last year. Uh, if, you, if you look at that, I mean, you guys have 240 units pending right now. That's insane. Like, you've had your biggest month ever last month. I, yeah, I'm taking it. See that? You can see it right here. By the way, look at the, this. Is the two big things right here? 119 is what we uh, pended in June. 119 units. Yeah, uh, insane. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's been it's been insane. And again, it's it goes towards our model. About 45 to 50 percent of our business is ISA procured, because that's what's so cool about our model is a lot of people just think my agents don't chase leads. They do. <laughs> they chase their own SOI, and that's what's been insane. Is if you want to make yourself recession proof, you need to be diversified, and we chase the living heck out of company leads. Um, and about 45 to 50% of our business is company business from ISAs. The other 50%, give or take, is SOI business, right? It's a combination of, of half and half. So that's been what's so cool to see is our agents, we're going to have agents sell over 50 uh, SOI deals this year, a few of them. And we're going to have two buyer agents break uh, 115, 120 deals. And we've never seen that before. And you know, our whole model is obviously built off of scale and growth and, and the I, I have to reiterate just going off the agent count isn't telling the whole story we have partners that support them we're highly leveraged our whole team with support and everything is about 35 people give or take um but the model works <laughs> you know and, yeah. and the the churn we went through some churn a few years ago uh, growing pains for us wrong people but we haven't really had any churn now for 18 months. Yes, I knocked, knocked on wood. Um, and it's really, everything's clicking. And then you take into account the fact that the ISAs were, were forecasting. For, so, so you all know, Jim's goal next year that we started talking about, Jim's the top ISA in the country, is 350 deals. That's the number we're talking about, is Jim being a part of 350 deals. And, one of the best things we ever did for Jim, if you all want a funny lesson, was 
we moved him out of leadership and he's 100% focused on production. Best thing we've ever done because that's where he thrives and he just loves it. And then we moved Cody, one of our ISAs, into the leader, uh, lead ISA role. And it's been a fantastic fit because Cody loves leading and Jim wants to go produce. But 350 deals from one ISA. Now, Jim is just, you, you, Nate knows him, best ISA out there, hands down. Um, and if you put him, you scale him, and that's what our plans are doing. And then alongside, you know, structurally, and if you're focused on tech, get out of the way. It's just, it's been insane. So we're pretty excited. We think next year we'll easily, in the next two years, our goal is to double our business. And with technology and the right people, we're going to get there. I have no doubt about it. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I mean, that's incredible. Just to, to see that kind of growth is uh, really unbelievable. And especially in a time that a lot of people just threw in the towel, right? Stopped working, gave up. Look at this. This is the, the numbers that we should look at right here. These are the two numbers that nobody's talking about. These are April and May, right? Most people in April and May, they were gone. They were in the bear cave hiding. Uh, we said, let's go, uh, let's go look at your appointment set as well. Scroll down just a little bit more. Yep. So there you go. So appointment set and met just through the roof. Yeah. And, and here's the thing is we really just started using CC really well. So some of the data is probably missing, but I know in April, 113 appointments met. Um, and then set was 169 in April, right? Like it's just, it's crazy. <laughs> And everybody thought everybody was so afraid to reach out to people. And we, we took the opposite approach. Our whole approach was, no, we're calling. We're going to be doing everything nobody wants to do right now. And yeah. the funny thing is, is that if I go look at my clients that did that, when people were coming out of this, there was two experiences, two different experiences. People were like, oh, our business is up 30, 40%. And some people were like, oh, we're down 20%. And obviously we were in the, the latter and a lot of our clients. So it's all mindset. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations again. Um, let's see how are we doing on time. We just have a few minutes to wrap up. So uh, in wrapping up, you just mentioned blitz scaling. I'd like you to talk about that a little bit more. I think that's a great thing. A great book. Everyone should read it. Uh, also go listen to his podcast because he, he's got some great things in his podcast, but Want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the, the big thing and, and uh, that I really learned from it was blitz scaling is really doing or really the idea that sometimes you got to do things that everyone else won't do. It goes against traditional conventional wisdom. Um, and it's doing things that, that don't really scale. The podcast that you just brought up, the author is Reed, Reed Hoffman, right? Yeah, right. yep. that's right. Uh, uh, the podcast is Masters of Scale. Um, yeah. And he has guests on there. Long story short, Reed was a, I believe, founding member, member of PayPal, correct? And PayPal and then LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yep. So yep. big guy, very well connected, but he has people on Masters of Scale, like Mark Zuckerberg, for example. And I know he gets a lot of flack, but the dude has built one of the best businesses to ever live, frankly. Yeah. And you know, one of the, the really cool things, I actually just listened to the Masters of Scale podcast and Mark Zuckerberg's original mantra for Facebook was move fast and break things. And yep. if you're in tech, you know that. That's our mantra right now is we're just moving fast and breaking things. Frankly, sometimes we release some things that don't work that well. <laughs> well, you have to because what happens is the user tells you it doesn't work and you fix it. And really a lot of the idea of blitzscaling is just do it, get things out there, try things. Um, a lot of people hesitate because they want perfect. And the problem with perfect is first off, you're not gonna be right, you're gonna be wrong. Um, your idea of perfect will be incorrect. But secondly, perfection actually comes from feedback. And you'll only get that feedback once you get real world market advice. So a lot of what we're doing and everything we've frankly always done is the idea of blitz scaling. We blitz scale, you know, in basically March and April when nobody else would. We were, I, I kept telling people, double down on your effort, triple down on your listening and quadruple down on your empathy is what I just hammered. That was all I said over and over every webinar I did. And I mean, you, you guys just saw it, it paid off. Um, yeah. and, and that's what it is. Blitz scaling is really going all in, spending money when everyone else isn't, right? It's just leaning in when other people are 
are flying away, I guess, in my opinion. So that's how I took it. It was, I, it, I it's, uh, I, I've always loved Reed. Uh, I've listened to his podcast all the time and blitz scaling. I mean, if you look at CISA, when we first rolled out, we launched with an app. We didn't have anything on the web. We had an app that I was embarrassed about, but we launched <laughs> oh. because, because we had a few teams who were doubling their, doubling their production of their agents mm -hmm. just by tracking. Yeah. Right. And so that was just a very small piece. It wasn't anywhere near we, where we knew we needed to be, but it was enough for us to start to gain some traction. Yeah. The, the rule I think, that he came up with was you should be embarrassed of your first product. You should yeah. be like, you should laugh at it, right? And not care about it. But yeah. we you probably see it. I mean, we see it in real estate where a lot of people are just so they want perfect all the time. And it's really funny because one of my other friends to tie this all together is uh, Miles, uh, who founded You Betcha. I don't know if you've heard of You Betcha, Brian, but in the Midwest, he's basically become this uh, almost like how would you describe it, Nate? He, he's a celebrity. celebrity. Yeah, celebrity. He's a celebrity up here. And he's just uh, an online celebrity and he creates short videos. And he said his whole philosophy is I want to create basically um, five sevens. And he said where everybody goes wrong with social media is they want to create one ten. And you don't ever create it. It's the same concept, right? Of Just get out there and put stuff out there and you'll get feedback and make it better. And for him, he did that. And his first few videos are meh. And then he did one video that blew up. And it was a video of him comparing Bush Light to Spotted Cow in Wisconsin. And it's been viewed, I don't know, the dude collectively has uh, over a billion views on his videos. It's insane. And he's just, you know, a friend of ours from Fargo and a former uh, uh, quarterback from Moorhead State University, Moorhead, my alma mater. So it's crazy i actually paid him once to record me and now he's this celebrity in the midwest it's insane go check so, out you instead five. of instead of 110 five sevens is that what five i is that what i heard five, five. yeah just go put stuff out there and he follows gary v basically put it out there you yeah. don't have to be perfect and because perfection is a break right it stops you from doing something because you'll never hit perfect and he you doesn't know what you'll never hit perfect. So if you wait yeah. for perfection, you will never do it. So no, exactly. great, great lesson for us to end on you guys. Thank you so much for joining today. I love catching up with you, Nate. It's good to get to know you better Absolutely. and uh, best of luck. Stay in touch you guys. And thanks for all you do for the industry. Thank you for joining us on our podcast. If you have an interest in a free seven day trial of Sisu, go to sisu.co, S I S U dot C O. Make sure that you use the coupon code GRIT, that's G-R-I-T, to waive all your setup fees and receive a 10% discount on your subscription. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and want to subscribe, search GRIT, the real estate growth mindset on iTunes, Spotify, or Podbean. And with that, we'll catch you next time. Take care.